In this episode, we find the paradise we've been searching for. We're close to disaster when our anchor drags. We discover that our paperwork is not in order, requiring a trip to Tahiti to fix it. I stumble upon a charming local church. We built our warm Tiki 38 inspired by the ancient Polynesian double canoes. Our ambitious plan was to disassemble our little boat, ship her across the ocean in a cargo ship bound for Tahiti. Then reassemble her for new adventures in one of the world's finest sailing paradises. I dive into the clearest turquoise water I've ever seen and realize that we chose the perfect colors for Bada Bada. The turquoise hull mirrors the sea and the orange beams glow in contrast. Anchored in two to three meters of water, I spot a pink conch shell on the seabed and pick it up. A short trip ashore and a local man gifts me a stock of bananas with a warm smile. Are we happy? Are we satisfied? Is this what we dreamed of while struggling to build Bada Bada? The answer is a resounding yes. We're enjoying ourselves, whether going ashore or tackling endless tasks aboard, organizing the cabins, installing shelves in the toilet slash workshop, or fixing the steering wheel. We add an anchor chain stopper, connect the junction box for electricity and puzzle over a solution for the sunshade. When rain arrives, we close the hatches, retreat to our cabins and listen to the drops drumming on the deck. It, it occurs to me, we should collect the rain water and I rush back setting out buckets and pots and even the dinghy fills up for washing clothes. Funny how one's relationship with water changes when you can't just turn on a tap. We all think this is paradise in sun and it's paradise in rain. A calmness settles over the boat. Odvar hikes ashore, Jan and Sophie sunbates, I swim and Leif Eric, our hero, dives into tasks aboard, as always. Days blur together, it's easy to linger in this bliss. Late one night I wake up to rain lashing the deck and the wind howling. In my snoopy nightgown I rush to secure the boom tent, lowering it into the deck. I crawl back into my warm bunk thinking I should have dried off first. But as soon as my head hits the pillow I sense something's wrong. Leaping out, I realize our anchor is dragging, our little vessel is moving, and with only one anchor set, why did we just set one? It's not holding, and we're drifting. Laferic is already on deck trying to start Freddy, our 15 horsepower Mercury, outboard. But Freddy won't start, and we're drifting towards the reef. Surrounded by boats, I wonder, will we hit another boat first or the reef? Lafayre yells, get one of the other anchors. I dash to the forward cabin where eleven sails, ropes and extra anchors lie buried. Lafayre lets out more chain 
while I scramble to get an, an anchor out and then another. Yesterday it was all joy, today sheer terror. Finally we feel ourselves securely anchored again. Taking bearings on shore we confirm we're holding steady. We sit there for a long while, cold and wet, before retreating back to bed. Morning brings sunshine and everything seems better. The sky is clear and the sea looks calm again. We decide to find a safer anchorage and head deeper into Cook's Bay, a place called Pau Pau. It's surrounded by rugged mountain peaks and it's a view we recognize. Our sailing hero, Alan Toms, sailed here in 1931 after nearly sinking on the short passage from Papete. He, his wife Julia, their son Tony, and their dog named Spare Provisions had anchored in Tahiti for months, nearly surrendering to Tahiti fever, a term probably made up by Norwegian sailors when they found it almost impossible to leave the paradise of Tahiti. And Norwegians still use that term. Reading aloud from Alan Tom's book, The Cruise of the Teddy, we let our thoughts drift back in time. Here in this very bay, Alan and his family had admired the same breathtaking view. The next day, an email from Katya from the agent brings me back to the present. We're not finished with the paperwork after all. Some documents are still missing. I start to worry, hadn't we already pay, paid a hefty sum in Polynesian francs? It looks like I'll have to visit the customs office in Tahiti. I get up at 5.30. In the pre-dawn darkness, Leiferic rows me to shore. I walk in between tall palm trees to the narrow road circling the island and catch a bus to the ferry. Once in Papete, the capital of Tahiti, Google Maps guides me to the custom office. After a long, hot walk along the pier, I knock on the door and meet three staff members. A cheerful man, a smiling face and a thin woman with a stern look. Unfortunately, it's the stern French woman who attends me. She demands paperwork I don't have and expect me to speak French. I slip out thinking, what now? I contact Katya for help and invite her to lunch. She asked me to come to her office, so I retrace my steps back into the city. When I arrive, the office is being cleared out. Hero, the person emptying the place, tells me they've moved. Katya must have forgotten to mention it. But Hero, living up to the name, drives me to the new office. I race up the stairs and find Katya and she says, let's go to my car. In the car, tucked into the pocket of the passenger's door, is a small stack of papers tied with a rubber band. It looks like they have been there a while. We rush back to the custom office. The stern woman raises an eyebrow and says, rapid. Is that a smile? Within minutes, the paperwork is done. Katya and I decide to visit the harbor master and immigration just to be sure. And believe it or not, everything is okay. We celebrate with a late lunch of poisson cru, raw fish in lime. I'm tired, full and satisfied. Katya heads back to work and I catch the ferry, then the bus. And just like that, I'm back in paradise. Laferic is impressed by, by all I've managed in such a short trip. We sit down for a drink of brown rum and local pineapple juice, the best I've ever tasted. But when we try to light the kerosene lamp, we realize we're out of kerosene. I dryly remark, looks like I'm setting off on a new expedition tomorrow. Once again, it's early morning. It's always best to get started early. By midday, the heat is unbearable. As usual, I've dressed neatly. It's after all Sunday. 
I catch a ride immediately and when I realize that a well-dressed woman driving is on her way to church, I decide to join the service too. We arrive early and I sit beside an elderly lady. With my usual greeting, Itai prao prao reo farani prao prao reo tahiti nene. Meaning, I don't speak French, but I speak little Tahitian. The ice is broken. She kisses me on both cheeks and we strike up a conversation. She's had surgery on both knees and suffers from glaucoma. Her grandson is singing during the service, she tells me. My Tahitian is really picking up. Half an hour later, the congregation rehearses hymns, the lyrics projected on the screen. It's the most beautiful service I've ever attended. When a group of children dressed in white come forward for communion, tears well up in my eyes. The service ends with everyone joining hands, singing a hymn together. I leave the church grounds and continue my search for kerosene. I walk alone along the narrow road with a red jug in one hand and my thumb sticking out. Across the street, one of the church musicians strolls by, still playing his ukulele. A huge thank you to all our amazing supporters and subscribers. Join our patron tribe for just the cost of a coffee each month. We're designing a unique mug for every episode of our adventure. Start collecting now.